I'd like to talk about now, what I'd like to talk about now is, is what languages are. Uh, and languages differ from one another in a wide variety of ways, but they have some things in common, uh, things that distinguish language from other forms of communication, such as animal communication. There are some things that all languages do, and I'd like to talk about some of those right now. I've made a list drawing upon um, a book by Yule called Study of Language and a book by uh, Connor Linton and Fasshold uh, called Introduction to, uh, Introduction to Language and Linguistics. So drawing upon these two books and putting them together, here are some properties of language that they identify. I'm going to introduce them briefly and then I'm going to discuss each one in more detail. Take a minute and look over this list. Language users demonstrate reflexivity. We have the ability to use language to think and talk about language. Languages uh, involve displacement. We can use languages to talk about things that are not present in our immediate environment. Language relies on context. Uh, the language we use is often part of or informed by the immediate environment. There's a certain arbitrariness, arbitrariness to the linguistic form. The linguistic form has no natural or iconic relationship to the, with the thing it refers to. The word dog has no natural connection to the four-legged animal identified by that word. Productivity. The human, uh, humans have the ability to continually create new expressions and novel utterances by manipulating their linguistic resources to describe new objects and situations. In other words, we can make up new words. We can uh, use language in creative ways and other people can understand what we mean. Um, cultural transmission. This is the process whereby a language is passed on from one generation to the next. Our children learn languages from us. That kind of seems obvious. It is, a, it is something that all languages have in common, and we'll talk more about that in a, in a minute. Duality. The human language has both a, a physical and a semantic level. There, there are the the physical level, there are the sounds that we make, and a semantic level, the meaning that is made from those sounds. Modularity. Uh, just as there are different systems in the brain uh, involved in language production, uh, linguists can divide language into different modules, different areas of study. Constituency. We can organize words by parts of speech and when we know what a word's part of speech is we can use it to replace other words with the same part of speech. Um, sentences are made from clauses which are made from phrases which are made from words. One part is a constituent of the other. Recursion. Uh, this is the principle that if you can do something once with the grammar of a language you can often do it repeatedly. Discreteness. The user of a language has to be able to distinguish the different pieces of a language and it has to be able to separate the sounds out to know when one word finishes and the other begins. So basically this means that uh, words are made up of smaller parts. Variability. There's a great deal of variability both within and between languages. So now, I'm going to talk about each one of these things in a little more detail uh, and individually. Um, first, reflexivity. We can use language to talk about language. You can tell me, you can tell someone that they're being too loud, that they sound like a snob, that their accent is atrocious, 
that they shouldn't swear too much. You can think about your language use and reflect upon your grammar mistakes or reflect upon things you said that you wish you didn't or things that you felt made you sound stupid or um, or whatever. I doubt a cat has ever wondered whether its meow is in the right pitch or a dog has ever told another dog not to bark too much. So by reflexivity we mean the ability to use language to think and talk about language itself. Next we have uh, displacement. Um, humans can use language to talk about things and events not present in the immediate environment. And this is something we learn to do. It, it isn't something that children uh, do in the early stages of language learning. Uh, Yule identifies displacement as one of those things that distinguishes human languages from other forms of animal communication. Yule writes, when your pet cat comes home and stands at your feet calling meow, you are likely to understand this as a message related to the immediate time and place. If you ask your cat, where it has been and what it was up to, you will probably get the same meow response. Animal communication seems designed exclusively for this moment, the here and now. It cannot effectively be used to relate events that are far removed in time and place. Uh, he notes that the, there's a small exception that bees seem to be able to communicate the location of a nectar source they have just visited, um, but not one that was visited the other day. So bees seem to be able to communicate about place or distance. Next we have reliance on context. The flip side of the ability to talk about things that are not here and not now is the extent that language use relies on context. Language use is often uh, understood with reference to things in the environment or things that have been previously said, the co-text. For example, the sentence, she was here yesterday, refers to a place here, which is interpreted contextually as referring to the immediate environment, and a pronoun she, which refers to a person, either present in the immediate environment or previously mentioned in the conversation, and finally, yesterday, means something different on December 2nd than it does on October 2nd, so that too is only understood in relation to context. If you ask somebody a question like, do you want a pat? Do you want a pat? Well, passing the butter, they're going to assume you mean a pat of butter, not a pat on the head. Words are interpreted contextually with reference to both the words around them and the world around them. If someone said, I want to, would you know whether they meant I want to or I want to? I want, I want to as in I want to do something or I want to as in I want to of something. You might need to depend upon the context to interpret that. Next is arbitrariness. Um, another property of language is arbitrariness, and that is the linguistic form dog has no natural or iconic relationship with the hairy four-legged creature, uh, four-legged barking object out in the world. For all the rules of language, there's still an arbitrariness to much of it. There is nothing that says that makes the English words one, two, and three a more appropriate way of expressing the concepts than the Korean words il i or sam or unos dos tres or um, or any other language. There's nothing about an apple that makes the sounds ap and l necessary. It can just as easily be known as a sagua or a palm. None of these words are necessarily tied to that that object. So there's an arbitrariness to it. Even onomatopoeic words, uh, words that are supposed to sound like what they are, can be different in different languages. Um, in English, dogs say bow wow, cows say moo moo or moo, roosters say cock a doodle doo. In Korean, dogs say mong mong, uh, cows say ume, and roosters say kok yo. Um, Neither Korean roosters nor Korean children are wrong. Uh, that in Japanese, the closest sound to the English F is less fricative, um, involves a little less turbulence, and in some ways is closer to a, an H that's been bilabialized. Uh, you can find it on when we talk about phonetics. Um, uh, f sound. This is not wrong. Um, the, Yule gives an example of arbitrariness in script. Uh, we can look at the Arabic word 
for dog and from its shape, uh, for example, determine that it has a natural and obvious meaning. Sorry, we can't just look at the Arabic word for dog and from its shape, for example, determine that it has a natural and obvious meaning any more than we can with the English translation form dog. And even if we get into pictographic characters where uh, there's an attempt to, at, at early stages in, in orth orthographic, sorry, in early stages of logographic writing, when it's a, more at a, a pictographic stage, a pictographic stage, there's an attempt to represent the thing, a, a drawing of the, the thing, a drawing of the thing the word refers to. Um, over time, those uh, those lines become less significant, less connected with the object they're describing, and more um, connected only with each other. A certain level of arbitrariness enters in, even with even in those parts of language that attempt not to be arbitrary. Another property of human language is productivity. Um, productivity is the ability to continually create new expressions and novel utterances by manipulating our linguistic resources to describe new objects and situations. All languages allow for some kind of rule-driven creativity. A couple of years ago I heard on the radio uh, a commercial that talked about um, switching cell phone providers to resist big billification. Um, this was an invented word, but its meaning was obvious because it follows certain morpholo morphological processes that allow one word to become another. The rules themselves are of clear interest um, to English teachers, but the creative aspects of productivity are as well. My ESL students and I often end up in discussions about uh, whether a word exists, whether they just made it up, uh, who gets to make up new words. You will notice that productivity is one of the properties of human language that distinguishes it from animal communication. The communication systems of other creatures are not like that. Cicadas have four signals to choose from and burvet monkeys have 36 vocal calls. Nor does it seem possible for creatures to produce new signals to communicate novel experiences or events. We can. Cultural transmission. If the various linguistic forms are arbitrary, then how does a form become linked to a specific meaning? Cultural transmission is the process whereby a language is passed from one generation to the next. It's clear that humans are born with some kind of predisposition to acquire language in a general sense. However, however we are not born with the ability to produce utterances in a specific language, such as English. We acquire our first language as children in a culture. Cultural transmission refers to the various four meaning links that are made through exposure, experimentation, and interaction with other users of the language. So in other words, we learn it from the people around us or uh, from our families. Um, communication patterns with animals are more reliant on instinct and less reliant on the presence of others. Human languages do not develop in isolation, and human beings don't develop language in isolation. If you lock somebody in a room and feed them through a slot in the door and never communicate with them, they do not develop language. Uh, animals would probably develop uh, a, a less well-developed communication pattern. The, the, their communication pattern may be malformed, but they would still have uh, some of the elements of the communication pattern of other animals of their type. Duality. Um, duality is the property that human language has both a physical and a semantic level. That human language is organized at two levels or layers simultaneously. And you'll give the example of uh, the sounds n, i, n, i, and b, and we can combine these sounds to form the word nib, or we can combine them to form the word bin. We can also combine them with other sounds to form other words. So there's a certain duality. There are these, um, this physical level, um, which we can manipulate uh, to connect with the semantic level. Uh, he says, this duality of levels is in fact one of the most economical features of human language because with a limited set of discrete sounds, 
we are capable of producing a very large number of sound combinations, example words, which are distinct in meaning. It's interesting to note that if our, um, if our language only allows for a very limited range of syllables, a, a very limited set of sounds, then words will end up becoming longer and longer and longer in order to make use of those sounds. Being able to take these sounds and combine and recombine them is incredibly efficient. Animals do not appear to have the ability to break down oral language to individual sound segments, such as consonants or vowels. Their signals appear to be relatively fixed. So, modularity. Ralph, um, or Fassold and Connor Linton write that most linguists believe language is a modular system. That is, people produce and interpret language using a set of component subsystems or modules in a coordinated way. This refers to how the brain processes language. Um, we know that we have different areas of the brain that process writing, that process sounds, that store the lexicon, that organize the lexicon syntactically. Uh, each of these seems to be to involve different regions of the brain. This modularity also parallels how language is studied. Some linguists study phonetics, some study pragmatics, some study syntax. Languages are organized into constituents. All languages allow for complex parts to replace simpler parts. For example, I could say, I bought it. I could say, so I bought it. I could say, I bought a book. I bought a book, red book with a shiny cover. I bought the wrong edition of the textbook listed in the course outline. The spot occupied by the very simple a book can be occupied by a much more complex phrase, um, such as the wrong edition of the textbook listed in the course outline. A learner of a language understands this very quickly, and perhaps automatically. There's no language user that understands you can say, Mary loves John, who doesn't also understand you can say, John loves Mary. They know that you can take, take um, words or phrases, um, take words that are the same part of speech and substitute them for one another. You can take phrases that are the same type of phrase and substitute them for one another. Likewise, we can take a sentence like, the farmer plowed a field, and change it to, the farmer harvested a field. Uh, language users have a sense of parts of speech, uh, although they probably can't always explain them. We cannot say, the farmer swam a field, we cannot say, and we can't say, the farmer har harvested swam. They both sound wrong, but the farmer harvested swam sounds more wrong, and wrong in a different way, than the farmer swam a field sounds wrong. Uh, the farmer harvested swam sounds semantic or syntactically wrong, where the farmer swam a field sounds semantically wrong. One doesn't make sense. One doesn't make sense and is grammatically incorrect. Um, we can. There are limits. There are limits to constituency. We can say uh, it is probable that it will rain, and we can say it is likely that it will rain because likely and probably are both adverbs and can replace one another, uh, can replace, we can replace one with the other. We can say it's likely to rain, but we can't say it's probable to rain. There's a certain lack of symmetry here. Um, and natural languages have this lack of symmetry. Uh, most artificial or invented languages lack uh, this um, asymmetry. Uh, most artificial or invented languages are, some, uh, languages are much more systematic. In many invented languages, if you can put an adverb in a certain place, you can always put an adverb in that place. This would make invented languages easier to learn, but less like natural languages. In fact, one of the reasons people invent languages is because they find it annoying that you can say it is likely to rain, but you can't say it is probable to rain. That kind of asymmetry bothers people who think language should be more logical. Recursion. This is the property, the principle that if you can do something once with the grammar of the language, you can often do it repeatedly. If you can add a prepositional phrase uh, to a prepositional phrase, then you can embed a third or a fourth prepositional phrase. So I can say, he went to the bar around the corner. 
two prepositional phrases. Or I could say, he went to the bar around the corner of the street in the west in the city on the hill. And I could do this endlessly. This is recursion. As a consequence, no one can memorize all the sentences of a language because there's a near infinite number of sentences in any language. Languages can't be learned through memorization. The Mother Goose nursery rhyme, uh, the, the house that Jack built, the, the, the nursery rhyme, the house that Jack built, uses recursion. Um, a noun phrase can include a relative clause. So we can say, this is the house, and the house is the noun phrase there. And we can get further information about the house by saying, this is the house that Jack built. Um, and in that case, the house that Jack built is now the noun phrase. Um, with that, that uh, with the Jack built being a relative clause. So, a noun phrase can include a relative clause, but within a relative clause, we can have noun phrases. For example, Jack is a noun phrase within the relative clause that Jack built. So since a relative clause can contain nouns, and noun, uh, nouns and noun phrases, and noun phrases can contain relative clauses, we can have this endless recursion again. And that's what happens in the nursery rhyme, the house that Jack built. Um, this is the house that Jack built, built. This is the house that Jack built. This is the malt that lay in the house that Jack built. This is the rat that ate the malt that lay in the house that Jack built. This is the cat that killed the rat that ate the malt that lay in the house that Jack built, and so on. Embedding relative clause inside of relative clause inside of relative clause, and we could do this endlessly. I'm going to spare you the endless nursery rhyme. Uh, discreteness. The user of a language has to be able to distinguish the different pieces of the language, to separate the sounds out, to know where one word finishes and the other begins. Using a language involves playing with these pieces, making bigger pieces, uh, so and these pieces can be moved around. As for studying a language, the problem be uh, as for studying a language, this becomes a problem because it's often not as clear to a linguist whether something is one word, or two, or one sound, or two. Imagine Lego blocks, which when put together, um, the lines become invisible. Language is like that, in that it's not always to see the pieces as separate. Uh, one of the challenges of linguistics is to show that r in l are different sounds in English, um, or that U and U are different sounds, etc. Uh, Fassold and Connor Linton explain it like this. Language is composed of separate sounds, words, sentences, and utterance units. The fact that we hear speech as a sequence of continuous, uh, sequence of individual words and sentences is an incredible accomplishment, and all the more incredible for how instantly and unconsciously we do it. Acoustic sounds blend into one another. If you have ever tried to learn a second language as an adult, you know how hard it can be to separate words spoken at a normal conversational pace. So this is one of the things that uh, language learners first have to do. Uh, children learning the first language have to be able to break it apart into these smaller pieces, recognizing the discrete parts. So this is discreteness. And finally, yes, finally, variability. There's a great deal of variability both within and between languages. There are different registers. As I said, the language of the pub is different than the language of the classroom. The language of the lawyer practicing law is different than the language of the lawyer practicing golf. And we should be aware of this variety and consider which varieties of English our students um, are going to need and for what purpose. A lawyer would speak differently in a courtroom than in an office. And if that lawyer had friends, she might speak differently to her friends than to the judge. People vary their language use depending on the context and who they're talking to. But people also have variations within their own language. There are also regional differences. differences there, there are regional differences. There are differences that point to social class. There are differences that point to gender. We have different dialects. A person's accent may let us know where they are from. A person's word choice might give us ideas, accurate or inaccurate, about their level of education. 
the properties of language, um, so there's a great deal of variability within language. The properties of language that I've been discussing tell us what a language is and how it varies from animal communication. These properties are held in common by all natural languages. These properties give us some insight into how language is possible and how it works.